few years ago, deep inside the darkest days of COVID's lockdown, I started to get some strange letters from the government. They were from the Colorado Unemployment Insurance Board claiming that employees who never existed at my company, Fox to Bus Inc., had been laid off and they were collecting benefits, which I was, I guess, supposed to be on the hook for. At first, it was just one letter. But the next week, I got five more and then 10 more after that, all from people who not only had never worked for me, but I had never met or heard of, or maybe they didn't exist at all. All told, I got 50 letters like this, and I knew it was a scam. I just, I mean, I just didn't know what kind. I called my local government and complained, but got nowhere. What I didn't know at the time was that I wasn't the only person getting letters like this. In fact, the insurance board was completely swamped with fake claims. An audit after the pandemic found that my state paid out more than $100 million in unemployment claims. $100 million dollars just in Colorado. It was out of control. So the state clamped down on payments and now people with legitimate unemployment claims in 2024 are having trouble getting paid because their cases are in fraud alert, effectively shutting down an important safety net. It's a total fiasco. But who were their perpetrators? Was it those same people who sent you fake Nigerian print scams in your inbox every day, or maybe it was North Korea operating some sort of paramilitary operation over the internet. Or was it a kid in a sweatshirt in a fancy computer rig? Now, I'm not an expert on internet crime, but I've been listening to this amazing podcast called Darknet Diaries every month for the last three or four years, which covers everything that happens on the dark side of the internet. And just last month, Darknet Diaries did a whole EP on how the United States was sending billions of dollars every year to foreign hacking groups in scams just like the one that I was caught up in. It's hosted by Jack Resider, who has become a sort of internet idol of mine. He's the kind of hacker who hacks for the good guys, but has a fascination with the bad ones. And I wanted to ask him about what happened to me and more broadly, what the past, present, and future of internet crimes looks like. And, you know, you'll notice here in this, you know, as we put him on the video that he doesn't look like a human. He looks like a sort of a Japanese kanji character moving around ghostily. This is because Jack is a privacy freak. He, he does not want his face to be known. And I think that just adds a little bit of cachet to him. I don't know. Anyway, his <laughs> show is amazing. So amazing that I suggest you go check it out right now. And now you're going to go hit that like and subscribe button in my show notes to Darknet Diaries, or if you're on YouTube, the pinned comment up top. Don't worry, we can wait. Jack, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, so let's just start at the beginning here. The government has spent what on scams? Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, I mean, the pandemic relief was, I think, approved for $3 trillion to be given to U.S. citizens, right? And a lot of people were like, wow, looks like the U.S. government's handing out money. Let's see if I can scam my way to get some of that, right? So there were a lot of people who were saying, yeah, I'm a U.S. citizen. Here's my name. Give me, give me some, too. And and they were just handing it out to people. It seemingly didn't even seem like they were checking very much. So a lot of this were going to overseas scammers, um, pretty unsophisticated attempts at ac actually getting money from the U.S. government. And uh, $100, $100 billion is an easy estimate. I think the, uh, the Secret Service confirmed $400 billion was stolen in this way. But well, some estimates, up. yeah, a trillion dollars <laughs> in some other estimates. Wait, wait, of the three, th th wait, I'm sorry, Jack, I got to go backwards here. I know. Of the, of the three trillion dollars that we approved, we might have spent one third of that on random Nigerian scammers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the Nigerian scammers, let's talk about that, right? So these, these are the people who used to send us emails that are like, hey, you know, the prince of Nigeria died and he was a relative of yours and we just need $500 to uh, send you the inheritance. And this scam worked because it's the numbers, right? If you send those a million emails out like this, there's got to be someone who's like, really? Oh, my gosh, I knew it. And send, send the money to get it uh, released, right? But 
But we laugh at that because it's unsophisticated. But these people haven't stopped. It's been working for them. They've continued. They said, you know, hey, why don't we try this? And why don't we try that? Looks like there's some tax fraud we can do. It looks like there's some fishing we can do. There's different things like this. And they've tried all these things to get better and better and better. And now they're able to do things like hyper-targeting U.S. like acting like U.S. citizens to ask the government for, um, yeah, tax tax refunds or um, handouts that the government is doing, you know, for COVID relief or whatever. Um, what was it? The paycheck uh, relief as well. I mean, it feels like. I mean, we were t- we were mad about a lot of things during COVID. I don't know if you remember COVID, <laughs> but we were. If there was a thing we could be mad about, we would be mad about it. But like one third of our money went to Nigeria and or like you know, maybe China or Malaysia or whoever else was running these scams. Like that feels like it should be the headline, not like a minor headline, but like the headline of like government corruption mm-hmm. and insanity. Why are they winning? Yeah, I mean, the other thing is like at first it was just one trillion approved, right? It came out in waves. And even with that one trillion approved and we saw billions of dollars getting sent to scammers, they're like, let's approve two trillion more. This is wor- this is this is not working. We we got to put more money out there. And it was like, wait a minute. Why isn't someone saying, hold on, we need to audit this. We need to check who we're handing it to. We can't just hand it out until we know the, who they are. Um, this is not this like and so it seemed to me that it was OK to have that much loss simply because it came out in waves and it didn't it didn't seemingly get better in each wave. I feel like that's the amount of money that Nigeria, this, the, the country of Nigeria should be hiring lobbyists to keep on getting America. To put right. up. I mean, yeah. it's in an, it's in an, it's and so you can start wars for that. Like you can you can literally fund all of everything we spent to to Ukraine uh, on that. But you know, let's talk specifically about the. I mean, there's so much to talk about, Jack. Um, let's just talk about one of the types of scams they do, which is called pig butchering, uh, which is you know pretty low tech if high effort. And recently, uh, I mean, you probably noticed this. Uh, John Oliver did a whole segment on why pig butchering is really bad and weirdly pretty well organized. They call it pig butchering. The New Mexico Securities Division calls them pig butchering scams. I know, but listen, don't worry. There are no pigs or any other animals involved. Yes, don't worry, there are no pigs harmed in this pig butchering scam, although if the words do make you squeamish, it's worth noting that there is a process through which pigs are harmed every day. It's actually how we get bacon, pork and other products. It's called pig butchering and it's exactly what it sounds like. Pig butchering would be where they 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 find a victim online, right? And they start chatting them up and they they get them to believe that they, you know, something that's not true, right? A girlfriend, um, a, an investment scam or investment idea or scheme or something. Um, and, and basically you're pumping them up, you're getting them, you're, you're fattening up the pig. And then when they say, okay, I'm ready to jump in for $50,000 or whatever, that's when the pig is ready for slaughter. That's why they call it pig butchering, right? So then it's like, okay, we striked, uh, we got a big payday, and now we can just like let this go, or we could try to, you know, make more if we if we can. Mm-hmm. So um, a lot of times it comes over as a romance scam. Um, you know, people looking for love on even dating apps, and then it switches over to WhatsApp or some other me- messaging app, and you know, pictures are sent back and forth. There's a love interest that's going. And then someone's, you know, the scammer's like, man, I'm making a lot of money in this crypto scheme. Um, just letting you know, it's really good. And the other person's like, well, I'm curious, tell me more, you know. And after a while, um, they're adding money to, uh, you know, they're sending crypto cryptocurrency to uh, the scammer in some way, shape or form. It's very tricky, trickery, right? There's some elaborate stuff going on here. And it's not one of these, oh, that's just, you know, our grandma and grandpa falling for it. it Gen Z millennials are falling for it, too, all, all across the board. So it's it's quite elaborate and dangerous. Yeah, and it's like it's like a link sort of between a really low tech social engineering scam, right? You're, you're, you're talking to someone and you're just trying to, to get them. And there's a long lead. It could be months before you even get the ask. And then you have this more, I, I guess, sort of a more high tech section of it where you create a whole fake website, maybe even a whole fake crypto exchange to make it happen. That's a lot of effort to put it in, but obviously there's a lot of money in it as well. Um, what would you say can be done about pig butchering 
you know, is, is it just awareness? Is it just get out there and just go, you know, like and share this video to all your friends? Or what is the, what, how, do we, how do we do something about this? Yeah, I mean, for me, I get a lot of messages incoming, right? Just because of the nature of what I do. And, and I just assume everyone is a scammer, a state actor. I don't trust anyone. There's like zero trust on every, every inbound email and message and everything, right? So the biggest red flag, I would say, is just if anyone asks you for money of any sort, um, just watch out. That's that's a real thing. And it's not so much giving them money, but it's like, hey, give money to this person over here or give money to fix your your credit score or something. I mean, I've heard the story where a lady was accused of well, a lady just, you know, an FBI agent, quote unquote, right? It was a scammer, called her up and was like, you you had your identity stolen. People have, you know, racked up a million dollars in, in debt. Um, we need to wipe your your you know entire identity and start fresh so uh, let's take all the money out of your bank account and give it to us and then oh we God. will um we'll you know clean that money give you a treasure a treasury check uh, for the same amount and you can start a new life with a new bank account and stuff like that and they actually spent weeks convincing her that there is this big problem that she has to deal with and so it's not even you know invest in this crypto thing or give me some money because i love you it's uh it's it's crazy it's good it's just there are a lot of crazy crazy stories um other ones are people posing as celebrities and then messaging people saying hey i'm this celebrity can you uh send me some money I, i'm totally broke or something like that i don't know what the story is but they're in some sad situation and if you like that celebrity you're like wow i can't believe you're messaging me and you could be gullible yeah. enough yeah, and there's a lot of things. Sometimes they target celebrities directly, right? Sometimes they're like, oh, you are a celebrity, and therefore they sort of know what that celebrity wants. Now, I am the most minor of celebrities, but I was actually approached by a Malaysian group like four years ago um, where they said, Scott, why don't you come out to Hong Kong and we're going to pay you $50,000 and fly you out on a private jet to speak? about at this big conference in Hong Kong and they had the, the names and the like the, the websites it all looked like I was like oh this is really legit it actually came through my literary agent and <laughs> I went like you know I was in like three days and like, I was putting together my entourage I was like they're gonna pay me dumb money to do this because I like it and and then I realized it was all bullshit mm -hmm. but it did I mean they 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 they, they can get you because they figure out where your vulnerabilities that's are. right yeah i remember when i was a teenager i was writing poetry and posting it online and somebody messaged me saying wow your poetry is so great we I, I can get this published would you be interested and i'm like yeah get it published so they said okay i'll work on it so they said they came back to me later and said i got it i got it published um the book is going to be out and it's so great people are loving it and um, we want to give you a copy, but it's going to cost, you know, $200 for your copy. <laughs> I was like, uh -huh. mm, I see what just happened here. You're charging me to, to publish a book. And probably I would get a copy of it, but it's just like I could have printed my own poem in a book and mm -hmm. got it for $2 at the print shop, you know. But um, the fact that they charged me 200 to print my own poem was wild. <laughs> did, did you pay it? No, but it it, it 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 did what you said, you know, it hit you on your vulnerability of like, oh, I, I think I've got some, I think my poems are good, right? Somebody likes it and you, you, you fall into this trap of it's, it's picking up. No, I'm telling you, everyone, the, the internet's loving this. And so it, 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 it does, find, they do find that. And so one thing to protect yourself against that is watch out what you're putting out there on the internet. You know, if, um, yeah. if you're putting out all these things that you're into and love and, and, uh, uh, you know, personal information that can be used against you in different ways. So people will l look up your information and then use that to, to, you know, trick you in different ways. Yeah. Well, yeah, and also like the scale, one of the things you point out so well in Darknet Diaries is how the scale of this is changing and also the international nature of it. And you do the, the great service to your readers of actually including links to some of the sources that you're pulling out, because obviously you don't do everything. We're all standing on the shoulders of other reporters. And in one of the articles you linked to on the, uh, the, the um, one of the pig butchering uh, articles, uh, to quote it, it says, these scams are not small scale conducted by lo a lone wolf on a laptop. They are collaborative, organized, and extremely lucrative operations, sometimes involving dozens of individuals working together across continents. And isn't it fascinating now that we have this collision of cultures through the sort of the magic of the internet where, uh, where it's, it's vast sums of capital, but also sort of like different even 
desires and cultural uh, assumptions that go into it. And because there's literally trillions of dollars going to these groups, they become these sort of giant sort of corporate behemoths. And in your, you know, in the last two podcasts, you did talk about two different groups of these. One was Exact, which w it runs like a, like a, just a hilariously Google-esque um, uh, diploma mill out of Pakistan. And then Black Axe, which is an African, almost voodoo cult. What can you tell me? Let's let's first go into exact. Who are they? What are they doing? And 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 what did they do? And what are they doing now? Yeah, they 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 make these fake um, universities and then try to sell people degrees in there, right? And and it's really clever because the con feels like the the student is conning the school, right? Because they'll they'll set up the courses and they'll get it all looking good, but then the student will discover. Oh wow! I don't really actually have to test out of anything. I can just mm -hmm. click like next, 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 next on every slide, and it'll say course complete. Congratulations! And you can get your course done like in in a minute, instead of uh, you know weeks or months. Mm -hmm. And and so it feels like you're duping them. Um, but yeah, once you uh, go through the material and you get your degree, it's not real. Um, and you you kind of realize at some point, wait a minute, I didn't actually earn this. But then but then they have this terrible practice of. Uh, you know, extorting you after the fact, right? Like you get this degree and you get your job and then they'll call you up and, and they'll say, listen, I know you didn't get your actual degree, but you, 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 you got a fake degree. I'll tell your boss unless you send me $5,000. <laughs> oh no. Or they'll say, uh, you need to pay an export license for this degree and that's an extra $1,000 or something. And they'll just keep adding and adding and adding all these things. Mm -hmm. And we have this sunk cost fallacy in our minds where, once we put so much time or effort or money into something, we want to see it through. We don't want to just cut our losses and leave. We really get stuck on this notion. And we can't let it go. And so that's what they prey on. Like, okay, we've got them in, you know, we, we've, we've already charged them $500 for the degree. Let's see if we can get another 500 or or $1,000 from them or whatever. And so they just keep ramping up this scam. And um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, a lot of lawsuits have come out and news stories have come out. The Pakistani government is like, okay, this, you can't do this anymore. And so they raid the offices, but um, they don't arrest anyone. And when they do finally arrest people, they don't really go to jail. And people don't really face consequences. And it's likely because, I mean, my guess here is that there's just so much money that the that the place is made, that they're paying off judges. I mean, yeah. there is, there's and, actually situations where they have paid off judges to get out of jail. But it, well, it even, just seems like there's some sort of corruption going on there. Yeah, but there's all like you also had this one moment in your in your podcast where, you know, eventually they did face some repercussions in the United States. And there was a big trial, a, a liability trial about, you know, you've, you've scammed people and whatnot. And they got out of it by scam using the same scams that they used against their, you know, their 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 diploma. Because they scammed the court. Describe to me what happened. Yeah. This was just nuts. So it was a class action lawsuit. I think like thousands of people were like, we got fake degrees here. We got scammed. And so. They uh, they said, and this is in the U.S., so they said, um, you know, exact, you have to come and defend yourself. Of course, they don't come defend themselves. What they did was they paid some other Pakistani guy to take the fall, and he comes up into the into the Zoom court, right? It's not even a live court. It's a Zoom court, and he's like, listen, I'm the one who made that website. It wasn't exact. It was me. I, I'm sorry I, I screwed you over. I'll take the, you know, I'll take the blame. I'm guilty. Go ahead. And they're like, wait, who are you? You're not even like a, an executive. He's like, yeah, it's fine. Don't worry. I, I'm the one who did it. And so the court's just like, fine, you're the guilty one. You got, you know, you're fine. Two million dollars or whatever the case is. And he's like, OK, thanks. And hangs up and never seen of again. Right. He's just disappears into Pakistan. And it turns out that he was paid by exact to just, you know, take the take the credit for the whole thing. And then it's just like they, they never got in trouble for it. It's like the Keystone Cops and it yeah. like the thing it worked. Not only are, are various groups not exact exactly scamming the government out of trillions of dollars, when they do get come to come into the court, they're like, oh no, it wasn't me. It was this dude we've hired, and you can't hide him anyway. It's not his real name. And the court buys it. It is, I mean, it's like playing whack-a-mole. Yeah. And you don't even it, have one of those whack-a-mole mallets. You know? So, you know, covering covering all these, you know, cyber criminals and stuff like this, it's always fascinating to me to just see the leverage that the that the dark side has compared to the light mm -hmm. side, right? You can only do so much while following the laws and, and being good. You only have so much 
you know, arse, you know, weapons that you can use to do to, to do what you need to do. But on the dark side, you're like, man, I don't care if I break laws. I don't care if I lie. I don't care if I cheat. I don't care if I corrupt or steal or even kill at some point. Um, we will stop at nothing. And that is very difficult to to combat against when one side is just not playing by any rules. And then the other side's trying to <laughs> desperately use the rules to, in the system to get mm-hmm. some justice that is just not working. Yeah. And, and, you know, this gets really dark when we start talking about this other organization. You know, Exact sort of has this almost funny corporate side of it with like, you know, free food at all of their conference tables. But whereas in Nigeria, Black Axe, mm. that's that, dark. That's a wild one, man. Um these guys, I was, I don't know how I ended up in this rabbit hole, but this is one of those internet rabbit holes, and I'm like, there's no way this is real. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm told, you know, in in in, in my interview, um, that there's the night, there's a there's a group in Nigeria that are using like voodoo and and hexing and witch doctor type stuff to work their scams out to um to scam people. And I'm like, wait, what's going on here? And it's part of this group called the Black Axe. So I'm, as I'm looking into it, I find out it's a very hyper-violent uh, street gang in Nigeria. And they're just, uh, they're killing like daily and and robbing and, and it's just hurting. And it's just extremely violent. And um, they, they, you know, they're trying, <laughs> they're trying to make money. But as you're trying to like, if you're going around Nigeria, trying to rob people and trying to make money, you might run into like a problem of like, man, there's not a lot of money on the streets here. What's going on? So then they realize like, Hey, we could make a lot of money if we do cyber crime. And, and so they have like a branch of this, of, of this black ax that does cyber crime. And, it, and it's kind of wild just to think in my head of like, you know, imagining these street gang kids, getting online and typing away <laughs> trying to hack people i mean it's not even hacking it's just like um you know convincing people to give them money and and lying to them and, and cheating and they really just don't care and so they've got they, they kind of even get off on it where you know and they when they cheat someone they'll get on the call with them and and mm-hmm. watch them cry and watch them just suffer and be like you know, they'll listen to their victims like, oh, my gosh, you lied to me and you promised this. And now my whole life, all my money's gone. And how dare you? And they're just laughing at them because in their world, they're really violent and awful people. And to just I mean, see some some Americans crying over them, losing money is just hilarious to them. And, and, and it's a really weird pocket of people, that black hacks. Yeah, when they get, when you get initiated into Black Hacks, you know, I've done, you know, I, I just like you, I, I listen to your podcast and I was like swimming down this rabbit hole as well. They will do things like to get into Black Hacks, you have to go murder somebody. You know, the, the gang's got enemies, so why not? And, 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 and the laws are a lot looser in Nigeria. It's a lot easier to get away with these sorts of things. You will murder somebody in order to sort of prove your way in, that you're a member of the gang and then they have leverage over you and then they're able to do uh, you know, that, that's, then you're running these internet crimes and it's a lot easier to like deal with a a sad American who got, you know, Mm -hmm. catfished and then lose their money when you literally just slit some dude's throat. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, you know, these people, they're in your living room. Like, you know, when, when, when you finally made a contact, you know, you got that phone message, you know, Hey Jennifer, your cat's at the vet and we've all gotten these dumb messages, right? Can I pick up your cat? And like, I have cats. I love cats. So I'll be like, no, I'm not Jennifer, but you know, maybe you can find her elsewhere. And then boom, you're in the scam. And what you don't realize you might literally be talking to a murderer. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't think about it like that, but it is, it is close to home. Like, you know, if you look at just the cybersecurity stories of the world, you see banks getting robbed or data breaches happening or ransomware on some hospital. And you're like, okay, it's not me. You know, it's some other company that has to deal with it. But this is a situation where, nope, they're targeting you and me and and our neighbor and our parents and our sisters and brothers. <clears throat> and it's like, wow, that's that's really close to home. It, you're right. It is in our bedroom. And we've got to be very aware of this. And, and it, it's, it's scary. Okay, okay, okay. Check this out. I was told by Jack after the podcast was fully recorded that if I just do this... It makes me look like a mysterious hacker person. Do you agree? Okay, well, the reason why I broke into your feed 
with my digital uh, hacking abilities known as editing software is that I want to ask you to help support this podcast. Um, and there's a couple ways to do it. Please leave a like and subscribe um, to the show if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're watching on Spotify, like there's like 12 ratings on the show or like 20 ratings on the show. Could you could you leave some stars? I need I need stars. I think because um, because stars are important um, for people to believe that this show is any good. So please do some of that. And I also just want to let you know that I have a Patreon uh, and a really cool community there where I get to send out all of these episodes, which I pre-record sometimes weeks in advance, and I put them on early there. Uh, and my Patreon support subscribers are really, you know, like the most important part of keeping um, this show running. And I just want to thank you if you're already a member. And if you are not, and you're listening to this, and you're considering, hey, I like the, the vibe of this show, please consider going down into the, the notes and hitting that Patreon and just checking out what I have there and consider joining at any of the levels that are, that are available. So without further ado, back into our conversation about hacking. Darknet Diaries is a great podcast. I think you have like, what is like 140 episodes, right? And yeah. and as I recall, one, if not your first, for one of your first episodes was on PBX hacking, which is like, for those of you who are in your 40s, you might have a vague recollection that we had these things called telephones where you used to dial and it was doot, 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 right? And that, and that at the very beginning of the, 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 as the as connectivity is emerging, even before the internet, you would, you would, could call into computer mainframes and with those dial tones access, you know, uh, you know, computer, like the equivalent of computer servers at that time. They're really phone trees at that time. And, you know, if you saw the movie War Games, you get an idea of what hacking looked like way back in the day. Um, but, just like in the normal world, you know, ha you know, technology has progressed, right? We we've gone through early stages of the internet. And now we're in whatever we are, Web 3.0 or whatever whatever decimal mm -hmm. you want to put on the the internet that we're on today. And we are now in the world of artificial intelligence. And you know, for all that we talk about with AI changing the nature of creative businesses, or 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 you know, or or <laughs> the nature of someone talking to me. Uh, in an interview, you, looking like a kanji character, right? That's probably AI that's involved with your current profile. What is going on with the future of AI in the dark web? Mm. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, so so you take ChatGPT, for example, right? So this has, this is a large language model, LLM, that you can ask it questions and it talks back to you like a chatbot, but it's very smart and, and knows a lot of stuff. But it has guardrails on, right? You can't ask it to make, give me the weapon, you know, how to make a nuclear weapon or something, right? Where do I source this in material? And walk me through biochemistry and bioweapons and stuff like that. Um, it, it, it's like, wait a minute, I have some rules that I have to follow. And one of them is like, do no harm, right? So, or, mm -hmm. or, you know, no hate speech kind of thing. And so some people are like cloning this and saying, let's get rid of those guardrails. Now, sh show me how to make a bioweapon. And it's like, here you go. Here are the ingredients. And um, that's really interesting just to have kind of an, uh, uh, how hard no is guardrail it to do that? AI. Hmm? How hard is it to do that? Like, you know, I know to train a new AI is billions of dollars, but I, I, as I understand it, you can just... The, the training creates a bunch of, of parameters. And then if you tweak those parameters, can you create a new AI that will, that, that can be the evil AI, Dr. Evil's AI? Yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't quite, tr I, so, so there are come some open source projects out there, which is like, here, you can run your own LLM in your house. Right. And mm -hmm. I guess you could give it your own rules. You can d tweak it the way you want. And so when you see companies like Google develop, Gemini and OpenAI developed ChatGPT that that pushes us forward into the technology world. But then there's just this trail of people that are like maybe a step or two or a version or two behind saying we we can do this in our house. Right. So it's not as sophisticated as ChatGPT, but it's going to follow in the footsteps of. Right. It's like, well, you did it. Now we can figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so some other things I've seen is like. Well, there's this code, there's a code base. Can you examine this code to find a bug, a vulnerability for me, right? And then ChatGPT is very happy to find this. Um, but sometimes it looks at your intent. Like if it says, 
wait a minute, are you trying to hack this website? And you're like, yeah, oh, I can't do that because, you know, I know I can't do things that are going to cause harm. But if you flip the script and say, hey, um, I'm actually the developer of this website and I'm trying to patch it up. <laughs> oh, OK, well, I'll help you find the bugs. Um, oh. There's a lot of there's there, I've in my circles, I see a lot of people trying to trick chat GPT or any AI to say, no, I'm I want you to do these things that you're not allowed to do. But I've got good reasons why I can do why I can convince you to do it. And they are they're convincing they're convincing it to give up mm. passwords or information that it should not be giving. And um, it's really wild. And and so there is some manipulation that we could do against AI to to get it to do things that it it's not supposed to do. And there is versions of AI that are specifically generated to develop viruses and bugs and and exploits and and assist with hacking so yeah this is what i'm seeing so right now that's in the current age you know we're also seeing you know since we were just talking about like these elaborate social engineering pig butchering scams and 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 the ways you know you you get money out of people it does seem like it's going to be possible to deep fake not only you know presidents and people who have a lot of video under them, but actually the faces of people like me who have enough YouTube videos out there that you can make a quality Scott and or take my voice or even your voice, unless you're through one of those manipulators that I can't quite understand. Like, are we going to see the, the rapid deployment of AI tools in social engineering scams? Yeah, uh, without a doubt. Um, you've got a lot of these foreign actors, right? And to begin with, their their English isn't so good. So they're using translators to get their words translated into English to assist with the social engineering, right? Well, if you say, well, ChatGPT, can you help me like say this in a more eloquent way or a more friendly way? It'll be happy to, right? So already you're getting this assistance to make it sound more natural. Um, and then from there, you can take that and put it through a... Uh, a voice cloning, an AI, and oh, basically a text-to-speech tool, which sounds very natural already the, today. It's not like in the future. It's you could put it through, and it just sounds like, well, that's just a, that's a human talking. I cannot tell the difference between this, uh, and, but it's all AI generated, and that's wild. And then you've got um, image creation and video creation tools, and, and like you said, deep fakes, where you can um, put someone's face on some other body or, or make someone do something in a video that they didn't actually do. And you can just invent what it is they do. So with these tools, does it help with a scam? Absolutely. Um, one story I heard recently was a, a person was, I think it was in Hong Kong, they were controlling the finances for a company and they got invited to a Zoom call. And on the Zoom call was the CEO and four other colleagues that this person recognized. And they all said, all right, yeah, we have a new you know company we've just bought, um, and it sounded like the CEO. It looked, it sounded like the colleagues, and they said we need you to you know send this much money over to this um, bank account, and it was all it was all just AI driven. There was no <laughs> the CEO was not on the call, and the colleagues were not on the call. It was completely faked. That and is nuts. It is <laughs> they, nuts. They, they robbed the bank with with deep fakes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it, I, I think the future is going to be hard for us to determine uh, fact f- from fiction. We're going to look at things and be like, man, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this is real or not anymore. Yeah. Everything is just so convincing. Yeah. And, you know, when, you know, I'm talking to, you know, your kanji face right now. Right. And so obviously, and one of the things you come back to all the time on your show are, you know, we have to take data privacy seriously. Like it's not just a, a joke. It's it's a real thing what are the security precautions that you take because it seems to me kanji jack recider <laughs> that you are perhaps maybe on one of the extremes <laughs> i want to i want to make privacy normal i don't want to be an extremist um i mean i believe that we've got to defend our privacy if we expect to have any if we stop caring about it I just don't believe that the governments, corporations, or or faceless organizations of the world are just going to give us privacy out of their own goodwill. Um, currently, what I'm seeing is they're selling our data. They're giving our data to the... Uh, they're selling it to advertisers, to data brokers, and then they're just giving it to the government. Um, and 
and and if it's not that, then then there's a data breach and all our data is lost that we we gave them privately. Like, hey, don't tell anybody about this. Whoops, we let it, we accidentally uh, let it go to the world. Now China has it, hackers have it. Well, I'm sorry, but we take your privacy seriously. No, you don't. So <laughs> you definitely I, don't. <laughs> so I'm giving. I, yeah, I want. I I'm at this point. I'm just like zero trust for companies, right? I don't want to give them my face, a picture of me, my phone number, my email address, like any of this stuff. Um, where my location is, uh, what my bank in, you know information is. Um, so I'll use like uh, virtual credit cards, where you just kind of you know buy a credit card with this amount of cash, and then. There you go. That's all the, the whole credit card. That's all it's got in it. Um, good luck trying so to find the owner of that and and, and get so more. You're getting out of like it or those Visa cards from like the grocery store checkout when you go to checkout. You like I need seven of these cards because uh, we're going. <laughs> <laughs> it, it used to be that, and now there's some tools online uh, such as Privacy.com that allow you to just spin up um, as many virtual cards as you want just Im- immediately, and it doesn't have your name on it or um, any tracking information. So it's, it's just great. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I do a lot of things to protect my privacy. I, I use a, uh, a phone that is very privacy focused. I use privacy focused chat apps. Um, and, and so when I say privacy focused, right, what I'm saying is the company itself that I'm using the service doesn't have access to my information at all. They, they, it, it's encrypted on my device, and decrypt it on my device, right? So if I'm storing a photo on, on the cloud, that cloud provider cannot see the photo no matter what data breach happens or or who they give that information to. It's it's completely out of their control to be able to snoop on me. And that's, that's what I think, if you're gonna say you take my privacy seriously, it means to me that you don't want any of my information. And if I do give you my information, you encrypt it in such a way that you can't even see it. Yeah. I, I mean, it does like, and I assume that right next to your desk right now, there's like a, a trash can full of burner phones. Am I am I right on this? <laughs> I do have quite a bit of phones. That's it's, it's a drawer, not a trash can. But um, I, I I use an app called My Sudo, which allows me to just make as many um, phone numbers as I need. So whenever I'm I'm signing up for a new service. Um, I'll just make a new phone number and give them that text message, you know, text number. And because a lot of places they require this in order to sign up. And I, and sometimes I even go to such an extreme where, um, VoIP number doesn't work. They're like, ah, we don't take VoIP numbers here. And so now, now I, now I literally sign up for a new cell phone plan for one month, (laughs) give them that number and then just delete the plan and be like, all right, I'm signed up. So get out of my life. (laughs) So is this like, all right, so Jack, do I have to be concerned for you? Is this something bordering on a, like obsessive compulsive disorder or is this what everyone should be doing because, um, uh, you know, it's not good to have your identity lost? It's- it's funny. I say um, I say some of this sometimes, and then there's someone who comes back to me, and uh, you know, like it was someone messaged me on LinkedIn and said, "How do I get my information off the internet?" And I'm like, "Wait a minute. Is this your photo? Is this your whole resume? Is this like all your thoughts? Like your LinkedIn profile has all your information, and you're asking me how do I get this taken off the internet?" And so to me, that's the crazy people are the ones that think, oh, I need to get my stuff offline at the same time while I'm just pumping out a bunch of my stuff online. And 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 so I, I just want to be that person that says, hey, watch out what you're putting online. Right. You're giving you're giving a lot of things publicly on social media or just anywhere that you're posting things on forums and stuff. You, you might not realize how identifiable it is to you at the moment, but maybe years later you you say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that username is connected to mm-hmm. that domain or whatever the case is, and now there's a way to identify you. Um, but besides that, all the information you give to these companies, I wouldn't consider it private. Um, health records are shared. Financial records are shared. Um, like, you name it, it's not private mm-hmm. anymore. And so it's very... It's maddening to me that the world isn't private. And there's something called a third party doctrine where it's a it's a rule that if the government says, if you've already given this information to any company, then we have the right to be able to get a subpoena to get that information. Um, because it's obviously not private to you if you gave it to Apple or or Amazon or something and let them know. So we want that. So they'll this is a reason why they can go into your bank and say, hey, you know, we we can take all the information on this use on this customer of yours, 
and it there's the, the privacy just isn't there. And so I really want to pull back that control and get back back into my my sphere of no, I I value my privacy. To me, it's very important to to have this and and not just give it up completely. Yeah, you know, but you know, there is an interesting. Um, I want to say contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. It's an irony here because not only are you very concerned about your privacy, you also happen to be an investigative journalist, right? And as an investigative journalist myself, I love the fact that I can go on the internet and find someone's mistake where they accidentally put their phone number in an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> for, uh, you know, for a gift card or something. And somehow that got archived by Google and I can actually track people down. That's sort of like a, the, one of the, the, uh, you know, that's the tried and true reality of what we do with, with, um, uh, as, as investigative journalists. And it's great that that's out there and we take advantage of it. And yet you are also so concerned about it. So let me break your privacy, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, impetus right now. And let's get a little bit of your personal history. Um, mm -hmm. Who are you? How did you get into this in the first place? And what are your parents' maiden names? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, you know, I started out loving computers. I think it was AOL when I got online and I was like, holy cow, I can talk to the world. This is incredible. And I fell in love with them and I never, I never stopped. Right. So I went to university and got a degree in computer engineering. And then I got a job doing um, network security. So this was looking, defending the edge of the network, stopping the intruders from coming in, looking for threats inside the network, just looking through tons of logs and then telling my customers. And, it, and in there, I, explain, I ex explored lots of different networks um, and lots of, you know, different entities, uh, government and retail and schools and all this kind of stuff. And it was really a great exposure just to see the insides, all these, all these major corporations. And then from there, I was just really getting into podcasts. I loved Serial and This American Life and Radio Lab, and I was like, "Wow, these are so great!" But there's some high stake stuff going on in the digital world that no, I don't see anyone making these sort of narrative, high, high storytelling, high production shows. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was very bland. And okay, let's talk about the news. There were. There was a breach this week and there was a breach that week and there was a new exploit. And I'm just like, yeah, unless you're a geek, you're not following this. And I was a geek and I was following it. So it was good to me, but it didn't really apply to the world. And so I wanted something that was like, look, there's a story here. And and mm -hmm. and I want to I wanna tell that story. And, you know, oftentimes when we hear the news, we don't hear the whole news until two, three, four years later. And then right. you see this long write up in, in Rolling Stone or or New Yorker or something. And it's like, wow, that's the whole story. That's really cool. And that's kind of what I wanted to do is this kind of slow news. I'll wait five years after the breach happens. And then I'll tell that story because now we have the whole soup to nuts part of it. And that's, that's going to be great. Let's go on this ride. And so that's what I make with Darknet Diaries is this true crime meets cyber crime, high narrative storytelling thing. Yeah, you know, let me just talk to you about like one of my favorite episodes of yours. It's probably how I found you originally because I, you know, I put out a bunch of podcasts. Um, you know, I was the EP on this podcast called Wild Thing, which sort of blew up, and it was you know my wife is the host of it, and uh, and it was in 2017 at a time when the Apple charts were were full of these sort of like spurious and weird podcasts. These podcasts where you're like, well, that, you know, they had like two reviews, but somehow they were on the top hundred and they, they all looked like they came from the same network or similarly low quality. And when you clicked on them, they were terrible. Mm -hmm. And then you were the person who cracked the reason for why this had happened. So what can you tell me about, about that? Yeah. I mean, I was just starting my podcast and I'm sitting on the couch scrolling the charts and I'm like, what are these shows doing on the charts and mine isn't like this is the dumbest <laughs> show and it, it just what? there was a i should be more recognized <laughs> <laughs> there was a little man inside me that was like something's not right about this and so i investigated and i found i traced it back to um some people in bangladesh that have figured out how to game the the apple podcast charts to get on the you know the high ranking high ranking these are the, these are the top podcasts 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, um, can I call you on the phone? <laughs> what? No. So I found him and uh, eventually I was able to call like four or five of them just to be like, explain what you're doing. How are you getting ranked up? And a lot of them were secretive and didn't want to talk. And I was like, where'd you learn it from? And I just kept going up the chain, um, finding the next person, the next person. And until I tried to find the person who's, who, you know, started a lot of it. I don't know if he started at all, but he he trained up a lot of people and they all love him. And and so I was like, tell me all this stuff. And he's like, I don't do this. This is a bad idea. It was, it was a fun kind of uh, tour of going through like the different people in, in Bangladesh. And, I, I, you know, Bangladesh is one of these places that has a lot of outsourcing, right? So you can right. you can hire people to do graphic design or writing or whatever it is in Bangladesh. And so they're like, well, let's make more skills. And one of the skills people like are, are promoting podcasts. So let's... um. Let's have this. So it doesn't seem so sketchy over there to me, um, but it's it's interesting that you can game the game the charts, and they do it by um, subscribing. Like just they, they have a thousand Apple IDs, and they just log in, subscribe, log out, log in, subscribe, log out, log in. And so the more subscribers, the better um, to get your to get your ranking up. And um, yeah. this was, and was fun crazy. to just discover it. It was crazy that you discovered that you could start ranking on the charts with as little as like 20 or 30 new accounts signing up in a short period of time that would get you ranked on the charts. I was like, my mind was blown because the, the st- it wasn't actually all that hard to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, they they would just do 50 accounts a day and with that momentum um, would get you ranked pretty high on the charts. It was it was wild. And, you know, for five bucks a day, they can they can do it. Now, of course, this this could get you banned from Apple podcast. If they detect that you're gaming the charts, that's against the terms of service and they could absolutely ban you. And this, this is what black hat marketing is, right? Black hat marketing always has this chance of you getting banned in the very place that you're trying to get big at. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not, I don't recommend it. Of course, this is not a good idea. Um, But uh, But you did do it, didn't you? You did in fact, well, hang on a second. guys. (laughs) Not for Darknet Diaries, but I did make <laughs> I did make a throwaway podcast just to see if this could work, and and it was, literally had like lawnmower sounds and blender noises and stuff. It was the most stupid thing, and I was just like, "Here's my podcast. Can you rank it up?" And they and they did. They got it going, and I was like, "Holy moly! Like zero quality in this show, and it's ranking." And and I watched to see what? did it did it did it gain any followers, and it really didn't. There was there was no mm. listens out of this, so. The charts didn't really have much of a impact. Oh, that's interesting that it didn't. Um, Because you would think that something like being on the New York Times bestseller list or being on, uh, you know, at that point, especially when Apple was the, you know, the main podcasting platform, things have changed recently. Um, But you would think that it would translate for some people to get into success. And you did talk to some podcasts who were pretty well known, although you didn't disclose their identity that did use these black hat tactics. And mm-hmm. it's, I understand the temptation as a, as a, as a you know, sort of small creator myself, I understand where you're like, well, other people are cheating. Why can't I cheat? Why, mm-hmm. why, why, why not? Yeah. And this is what I was saying earlier is like the, the, the good people of the world have to follow the rules, but the bad people. And, and I swear to you, I didn't, I didn't expose it too much on the show because I, I couldn't put, I couldn't determine for sure, but I swear to you a, um, a lady was promoting her podcast, making a big name for herself, and then pivoted from that to make a book and then got that book on the New York Times bestseller list. And I'm like, mm, I have a feeling that she's just gaming everything here. And now that she hit all that and got there, her her world has opened up. She's got like all these books, yeah. uh, more book de- deals, TV shows, like all this stuff. And I'm just like, oh, I saw how you started it. And I don't approve of this, but you made it. Yeah. And it's interesting. Yes. It's like lying on your resume. You know, a lot mm-hmm. of people, a lot more people went to Harvard on LinkedIn than have ever graduated from Harvard historically, <laughs> really? right? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, it's, it's very like, much like that. It's another level of that. All right, to to pivot once again, because, you know, you cover so many awesome topics on Darknet Diaries. And uh one of the things that that I think is very, very important, which is going on right now, is to look at the world of cyber warfare uh, and, and that it has become another battlefront, right? This is, this, is, this is when, for instance, 
Russia invaded Ukraine, it started with at least one, maybe two or three zero day attacks. And a zero day attack is a, is a exploit on sort of a, a piece of software that has never been identified before. So they're really hard to defend against, maybe impossible to defend against. And when Russia invaded Ukraine, they, they use these to cripple various defense mechanisms. Uh, and then Ukraine now has this, its own um, hacking force, which actually you can join too, if you just go onto the internet. And we're seeing cyber crime, uh, sorry, cyber, cyber war, as a, a pivotal thing in, in creating actually geopolitical changes uh, on the battlefront. What can you tell me about what that's looking like now and where, where we're going with it? Yeah, I think, I think the first time that I'll, I'll give credit to the word cyber war, because it, 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 it is a buzzword. You know, you, you hear people just like, oh, this is, China attacked my company and stole my Arlen intellectual property. This is cyber war. Oh, I, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> that's just <laughs> theft. Um, <laughs> So, so the, in the situation of the, the, the ransomware, not Petya, what was that, 2018 or something like that? Um, Russia released this terrible ransomware on as much of Ukraine as possible, right? They got it infected in, this, in their tax software. So imagine TurboTax getting infected with a ransomware that Russia put in, right? Well, who would that, would, who would that affect? The people who use TurboTax, which would be that, com that country that uses it, right? So it was, it was specifically targeted to the Ukrainians using this, um, this tax software. And it just, it, it crippled just the whole country. The, the subways were down, the ATMs were down, the hospitals mm. were down. Like every, the whole country was just hit with this. And when, and when you have this and, you know, power stations are down, it, it's really devastating to the country. And that's where I'm like, yeah, this was, this was intentional to just destroy and dis and it wasn't theft. It wasn't anything. It was just, let's, let's hurt this country as bad as we can, or at least in a significant way. Um, mm. And of course, when you do when you deal with cyber weapons, it, it can't be contained within borders. And so parts of Russia were getting hit. Uh, you had uh, Merck, a pharmaceutical company in the U.S. that was hit because they were doing some taxes in Ukraine as well, right? Um, and uh, other shipping providers were hit. Um, and so shipping started getting hit with just worldwide. Like, we don't know what our shipments are. We're like, what's in these boxes? I don't know. The computers are down. And so it was a real big problem for, like, a, a large portion of the world. And, and it was just, like, insanity um, to, see, to see a weapon, you know, just unleashed like that. And, mm -hmm. yeah, it, that, was, that was the first time I think we got a real glimpse of what cyber war could look like. Yeah, and we're seeing places like, um, you know, there's these hacking groups, I think, like Dark Caracol. I think you've written about them. Mm. And obviously the Stuxnet, um, of, so that, that's, that's probably, Stuxnet is probably the definition of what cyber warfare looks like right now in my mind. Yeah, I mean, what you're dealing, the, the U.S. at least has um, cyber technologies in every military branch, right? Well, so to back up, we've got these domains of warfare, right? We've got the... Land, air, sea, space, and and cyber is a new domain of warfare, and the military understands this. And so, there's an army cyber team, there's a navy cyber team, there's a marine cyber team, um, air, even air force has a cyber team. So they're using hacking uh, and and technology to gain an gain a, a tactical advantage in in the cyber domain, and 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 this you know. You can find a target of, you know, get in the cell phone of the person you're trying to get to so you can bomb them or or spy on them or whatever the situation. I mean, this is what signals intelligence is. It's it's getting information from the enemy so that, you know, ahead of time. Um, it's interesting. Um, I think the way they use it is a bit different than um, than maybe a, a traditional hacker, because the uh, the military might use a lot of D words when they're doing their cyber uh, attacks, What's right? A so D word. D word is destroy, degrade, disrupt, um, these kind of things, right? Um, and if you are specifically trying to destroy, degrade, or disrupt, well, that's an attack as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, getting in and just spying and taking information, right? So it's information collection would not be a D word, right? That's just collecting. That's that's gaining information. So you've seen. Um, I mean, I, I interviewed I interviewed an NSA agent who t walked me through the entire operation of when they wanted to take down ISIS, right? So they, they infiltrated the ISIS um, group and started just like, th they got permission to just destroy as much of the, uh, of the stuff that they were doing. And they were, they were, 
you know, had communications going. They had a magazine that they were working on. They had a lot of, um, co- you know, just channels and, and data that they are storing and uh, their logistics and stuff. Then they were able to get into all these systems and then just delete it all and destroy the VMs and, and delete the mm-hmm. keys and wipe the systems and just hurt them as bad as they could. And uh, it was really interesting just to hear that this is this is part of part of their missions now. And yeah, and probably yeah, a really it's... important one for someone like ISIS because ISIS, um, one of their main tactics was to use propaganda, right? It, it's 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 their beheading videos and those things to uh, they would distribute it all across the world so that ISIS, which was operating in the Middle East, also had these branches. There was one branch in Bangladesh. There's a branch in Malaysia. There's a branch in Thailand, and and they did that because of the, the 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 dissemination through the internet. Just that information became actually a weapon of war, which inspired subsequent attacks. So the NSA coming in and deleting all of their materials was actually a very active measure, not something that was just annoying to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know you can't really stop them, but you can slow them down. You can make it harder for them to continue and have their momentum and and have to stop and rebuild, and then mm-hmm. they'll reinfect and re-destroy or whatever. But that's their that's their motive, right? And at least in that operation, you know, in the world of hackers, right? We have you know hackers sort of there's two types. There's the white hats and the black hats, and I think this just probably comes from like Western tropes, right? This probably comes from cowboys, you know, on their horse, the good guy in the white hat and the black guy in the bad hat. And I can't tell (laughs) what hat you're wearing right now. You look like you're both. Um, I got a hoodie on. (laughs) Oh, natural. Of course. (laughs) It it should be hoodies, right? It should be hoodies. Um, But, you know, and, and, and it's, it seems like, you know, once you get into hacking, you're already sort of breaking the rules. Like to be a hacker, you're not operating in the standard versions of the operating system, right? You're trying to find ways in and out and there's the good guys and the bad guys. And obviously there's a tit for tat between them, but what, where is the moral gray, where is the moral ground between these two worlds? Right. And, and, you know, you've interviewed some people who are both white hats sometimes and they're black hats at other times. And do you see like the, Mm -hmm. a pass through on these two sides a lot? And, And also which is more profitable to be in? (laughs) had a pickpocket for fun and profit right i think i read that book as a teenager (laughs) um so i it comes down to intent um you can you can tell someone hey your fly is down (laughs) you know you should you should check it um and that might that might sound helpful or you could be like all right, dude, I'm going to take a picture and post, post this, your, your zippers down on the internet and, and expose you or, you know, like do something awful. And, and so finding the vulnerability itself isn't really the problem. Hacking into something isn't really the problem. It's your intent of what you're going to do. And that is so hard to figure out mm-hmm. in court or, you know, are you gray or white or black hat or whatever? Because it really, I mean, I, mean, I, I you could go into a grocery store and and start loading up some products and you're like, oh, I got, I got to check all this out, but I don't have enough hands. So you stick something in your pocket. <laughs> you mean to check out with it, but you accidentally walk out with it. And then you're like, oh, no, I got to go back in and pay or whatever. Right. Like this mm-hmm. is kind of the intent of I, I want to do the right thing. I want to tell this person, hey, you've got a vulnerability on your website or in your app. And you try. You found it. You You found some data that's exposed like, hey, I accidentally. I didn't I, I I didn't know admin admin was the password and username, <laughs> but I thought to try it and now I'm in and I can see your entire database. Mm. This is a this is a problem you need to fix, right? So you can just stumble upon things, which is which is just as bad as someone trying to get in and say, Wow, I got in with admin admin, I'm gonna delete everything. So right. they would have the intent to have some malicious intent, right? So so I think that's what it boils down to in the in the eyes of the court and the law. Um and it, yeah, I, I guess it's the same with, you know, playing with fire, right? Is fire a good tool or a bad tool? Um, it depends on what you're going to do with it. Uh, and, and there is a, like, it's interesting that there are two very big businesses on the side. Obviously we have the trillion dollars that went to the Nigerian hackers and what are they doing with that, that money? I really want to find out. Can you do an episode on that? Can you find out what the Nigerian <laughs> hackers are doing with their trillions of dollars? I know they're all, I know, I, I've heard that they're all addicted to drugs. The, the, the scammers that are part of, to uh, do, it takes Black a Axe lot of Nigeria. drugs. You cannot yeah. do a trillion dollars for the drugs, Jack. I don't know if you're what your history with drugs in, but they're not that expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like the whole GDP of Nigeria. Um, but but you know the 
the there are all these big businesses and you interview also these, these penetration testers, which are set, like they, they, they go in, they hack, they go into like military institutions and you, you have tons of episodes on these guys. Uh, and they always carry like a, a piece of paper from the CEO of the company in their pocket being like, yeah, I did break into your base, but this general here can vouch for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I find that it, it, I find it fascinating that there's an industry for this. Uh, and, and that it's probably a pretty lucrative one. Yeah. I mean, you're, when you set up your company or your business, you're like, I wonder how vulnerable I am. Could I hire a hacker to test me out? And it, and it kind of gets a scary situation. Like, what do I go on the dark web to like find someone? And so it's nice that there are companies out there that like, no, 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 we're trusted. We're legitimate. We're not going to, you know, hurt you or steal your stuff if we get in. And, you know, it's actually become part of an audit, um, system, right? So if you're getting... Uh, PCI compliant, for example, this is a, if you're going to accept Visa or MasterCard and store that payment customer data, like those the, the credit card information in your computer, you've got to be audited by the payment card industry. And part of that audit is to do a penetration test and say, hey, have you tried mm. to have someone outside break into this company and how successful have they been? And you you have to go through these steps. And so it's actually... Um, you know, part of, part of the audit process now as well. Yeah. I mean, that's great. It's great that that is out there. All right, Jack, I have just one question. And for the, the, the viewers who haven't been following my uh, social media feed exceptionally closely, you'll know that this is the second time that I've interviewed Jack because last time I forgot to press record after a great interview, <laughs> this one was great too, but, but there, there could have been a whole nother hour of our, of our discussing that, that exists somewhere in an ethereal realm at the moment. Um, but at the at, at last time I, 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 I surprised you with a question and you were like, God damn it, Scott, why'd you ask me this? But you've had now a full day to think about it. Can you give me some book recommendations? Cause I feel like you read cool stuff and I think I'm looking for a new book. What can you recommend? I really like Yuval Noah Harari. He wrote three books. One is the the history of humans. One is what's going on now with humans, and then what's the future of humans. And I, I really like the future um, book a lot. I read it like three yeah. times. But just in that wow. vein, I really like just what's the near future, right? Uh, near future, like um, the future is f- coming faster than we think. I think is a book by Peter Diamandis, and this was just it's just really fascinating to hear how we're how how where we are now because a lot of times we don't hear the update of like oh my gosh they figured out how to make flying cars wait i didn't get this memo why isn't this on my social media or whatever and um it's just really fascinating to hear where we are technologically and where we're going like in the next few years and then what that looks like right and so Mm -hmm. these books are fascinating to me uh i also really like the book the icarus deception by seth godin this one is um this one kind of kicked my butt to to stop my day job and really get busy on my personal projects to, you know, kickstart my, my creative career. And the idea here is um, don't fly too low in life. You want to really try to fly Mm -hmm. higher. And if you just kind of settle into your nine to five job and think this is great, I'm going to retire here. um, I really want you to do better. I want you to thrive and succeed and live like a, a super amazing, passionate life. And he kind of convinced me like, it's time to, it's time to do it. Go do it. Don't get deceived by mediocrity. Go, go make something great. I love it. That is awesome. All right. So we've got some book recommendations here, Jack. I just want to thank you so much for um, talking with me. It is a real honor to have you on this show because I, you know, one, I'm just a big fan. I just listen to your show a lot and I got a lot of inspiration about it. And I was like, look, I'd never really thought about pig butchering scams. And when you, your most recent episode came out, I was like, oh my God, something has to be said about the trillion dollars <laughs> that America may have lost. Headline, trillion dollars to these guys. I think well, 400, means- million, 400 billion has been con- confirmed by the Secret Service. So at least we can land on that number. And that's just as, as insane if you ask me. I can't even, if you were to show me the two numbers, like a pile of money here and there, I'd be like, they look the same. It, it is, it's too much. And it, it, it feels like it's a geopolitical amount of money, not, <laughs> not a, honestly, it's not, a, it's not a dark net diary story. This should be the cover of, <laughs> of, of the New York times for like a month, like a good yeah. month on that. Um, because 
where is it all going? And I really, really do hope that that we see a Darknet Diary story where you've tracked down the money, you've gone to the top guy at Black Axe, and he's like, you know what? I'm really getting into crypto now, <laughs> or whatever, whatever sort of bizarre thing happens. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That. What's interesting is that I, I have tracked down a couple of these, and what they, what you know, I mean, even the CEO of Exact. Um, likes to give money back to the community, right? So they'll build schools, they'll build housing, uh, they'll they'll become like this hero in their town so that when they do get in trouble, now all the people are like, no, that's a great person, don't put them in prison. And they fight for that person to get them back out and on the streets to do more crimes so they can get more help. Yeah, I mean, that's the old way, right? That's the old medieval way, right? And I've interviewed a ton of mob bosses who have the same... Um, same MO, right? They, they, they run all the organized crime rackets, but they also run a court, right? And they also, they also are, are giving to these political campaigns that they're actually the man around town. Mm -hmm. um, they're just founded on crime and it, get, it puts them in this very complex, interesting position. And it's no surprise that, that we're seeing that with these, um, these sorts of actors as yeah. well. Um, or Jack, where do people find you? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I know that you can, they can't Google your face because I found some really <laughs> hilarious um, Really hilarious results when I tried to Google your face the other day. Yeah, darknetdiaries.com, you can find my podcast. But um, yeah, put my put my name or show in any search engine and you'll find it easy. Awesome. Um, Jack, thank you so much for being here. And for everyone, uh, like and subscribe down below. Um, we've got Patreon. We've got all the things uh, that make this run. I think you have a Patreon too, right? Yeah, yeah, there's Patreon too. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that's how journalism gets supported these days. And, and uh, yeah, keep fighting the good fight. This was either Magnetic North or Scott Carney Investigates. I forget what I'm calling it these days. It all depends on where you're, you're, you're finding me. Uh, from Pokey Bear LLC in Denver, Colorado. Thanks so much. <laughs>